Okay, welcome everyone. I see we have 29 participants for the CreeNet and Agribusiness Economics and Management sections of AAEA. This is, I believe, our last track session. And here we are. Who knew uh, that a conference could last from July all the way to almost November? But, <laughs> but here we are with lots of interesting, uh, inter interesting sessions for our session, Hemp, Identifying Issues Across the Value Chain. Now, we're only holding this for an hour. So that means each of our four presenters will have about 12 or 13 minutes to present with, um, with a couple of questions in between there. And so um, I will introduce them as we go. The first speaker will be Hemp Production Network Effects, Farmers Grapple with Cross-Pollination Issues. The author is Jeffrey Young, who is an assistant professor for agribusiness economics at Murray State University. Um, hi, Jeffrey. We've never met before, but nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. So I think you should be able to share your screen. Perfect. And I'll try and I'll try and keep time. How about that? I'll put my timer on my on my iPhone. That'll work. That'll work. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, this paper that Tanner and I have been working on uh, is in progress. Uh, we completed part one and it should be coming uh, here in the coming weeks. I'll do a brief overview real quick of you know what we're looking at with him and why the issue that we're analyzing across pollination is, is interesting. So real quick for any of you don't know, him is group for marijuana. It's legally defined to have less than 23% THC. 2014 Farm Bill located for research purposes four years later in the 2018 Farm Bill. Kind of moved it forward for you know, commercial bag production. There's still a lot of stuff being, being worked out. The primary harvests uh, that farmers are concerned with would be either grain or seed. Uh, so you would harvest it similar to you produce it, similar to how you do it in row crop um, with some differences. But uh, the other option would be fiber. That's the more traditional, more familiar use. Uh, hemp for victory campaign in World War II to make rope and textiles and all of these now furniture and hardwood flooring uh, here in Western Kentucky. Our focus is on the third type, which is floral materials. So you can harvest the buds to extract cannabinoids. So these these uh, oils and resins. Various properties that, that people like. This is our focus. Of those three primary harvests, uh, this is the this year of the three. Usually associated with higher expected returns um, under the right conditions. Uh, some people have done very well with it. We're in a little more different times now, but that's still the general perception is that relative to the other two, uh, it's expected that. The return to be higher here, but the risk is still very high for what to do. Uh, why is the risk high? Uh, some examples immediately from the spikes in THC. So THC is the primary psychoactive compound in cannabis. And so if it gets above that 0.3% limit, it's declared legally as marijuana and has to be confiscated and destroyed. If it's below that, then you know, you're, you're good to market it. Uh, so that's one issue. Market instability is another problem. Uh, we particularly saw that in 2019 with uh, price crashes for floral material markets and uh, bankruptcies. Um, pests and disease, insects really like him. <laughs> I was just talking to one of the grad students yesterday about field trials and there's even more pests that they didn't know about in previous years. So that's an issue. And uh, the way to control that is a little up in the air right now because no herbicides or insecticides or fungicides are labeled for you know, usage on them right now. And so uh, the problem is, you know, still, still hard. The issue that contributes to this risk that we're focusing on in our work is cross pollination. Well, um, you can see the pictures there. There's both male and female hemp plants. Male plants produce the pollen. The 
unpollinated buds on the female plants or whether you extract the kind of roots from. And so, yes, you would anticipate higher average returns with the floral hemp if it remains unpollinated. If it gets pollinated, the cannabinoid concentration plummets because then the plant produces seeds in the buds now that the flowers are pollinated. Um, Non-floral or, in a sense, non-feminized, so both male and female plants planted in a field, ups the likelihood of uh, pollination to nearby fields. So as licensing or concentration of non-feminized hemp growers increases, then the risk of cross-pollination for feminized CBD and for floral hemp fields goes up. And so uh, what we would show with our model is that um, this could lead to a cascading kind of effect or a social network diffusion and lead to a suboptimal NASH with reduced floral production as we characterize it. Uh, so uh, what we can do with our work is define and parameterize a social network structure for hemp growers in Kentucky. Uh, but also, uh, after parameterizing and characterizing the problem for the hip growers of Kentucky, the problem is very generalizable from the model's results. Uh, we can quantify this cascading effect. Um, if there's a tipping point, we will define to in order to the uh, And put the network structure on structure actually. And then we can evaluate different policies. What can to or what can cause this cascading leading to the suboptimal uh, NASH equilibrium with the steady state? Therefore, what measures can be taken to prevent that tipping point from occurring? Okay. So, just starting back from the first paper we did. Jeffrey, I hate to interrupt you, but there is a lot of background noise. And um, are you in a noisy office? I'm not, no. I'm, I'm, You're not, okay. Um, so we don't quite know where it's coming from, but speak as loudly as you can and we'll try and get over it. Okay, let me turn up my microphone a little bit. Maybe that can overpower some of the noise, uh, hopefully. Um, so we're playing game theory and here we're looking at social network diffusion problems, specifically the ne the externality that we're concerned with is this pollination, right? So in the hemp production game, there are externalities and there are spillovers. And so consider two agent agents, me and my neighbor. So my neighbor's strategy is to plant floral hemp or non-floral hemp. My strategy is to plant floral hemp or non-floral hemp. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, the floral hemp producers have not only private revenue and private cost in their, in their function, they also have this social externality cost from any neighboring hemp farmers who are not growing a feminized floral hemp crop. Now, for that neighbor who's not growing a feminized floral crop, all they have to worry about is their private revenue and their private cost, right? Because cross pollination is not going to harm fiber or grain production. So that's not a concern to them. Each period, which would be a year for you know, an agricultural crop, farmers are updating their decisions. Okay, so as farmers are updating their decisions, these decisions are a function of individual payoffs. The individual payoffs are linked to the neighbor's actions because of this uh, externality. Um, these interactions are linked through the networks and what is driving that individual payoff part of the function, the decision function, is the number of neighbors close enough to me to cause cross-pollination, right? What crop types have they planted? Are they also growing feminized floral hemp or are they a pollination risk because they planted fiber? Right? And what is the transmission rate of pollination? So the marginal rate of pollination. Okay. So the extreme case would be, all right, so let's say we just had two agents and they're far apart. 
Although well, that's not really a problem because the distance that a column can travel is finite. But if we have multiple growers and they're close together and they're all growing different types, okay, there's a mixture, then we might have a problem. So as the concentration of non-CBD or non for hip growers increases, then the probability of risking a pollinated floral crop approaches certainty. Okay, so that, that's a problem there. And a floral hip grower who gets pollinated with the real tea best responds by switching to non floral hemp in year T plus one. Well, then if they switched in year T plus one, then in year T plus one, their floral hemp growing neighbors, if they have any, are now at risk of being pollinated by them. And then this cascade kind of kicks off. This cascade we would call social network diffusion. So the paper that gives the model of the well, line on it is Jackson and Morrow's 2006 paper, okay? So if someone adopts a different strategy that affects the other members of the network, then the other members of the network have to best respond to that strategy. Okay, that's the basis of what we're under. We can hit what's called a tipping point that kicks off this cascading effect, right? Um, from the model, we're able to characterize that tipping point. Okay, so if we characterize the tipping point, we can see that the resulting Nash equilibrium as you reach the end of that cascade is reduced floral production. Okay, we can also characterize what conditions or what factors cause that cascading effect. If we know what's causing the tipping point, we also know, therefore, what can prevent the tipping point, right? What policy constraints can be suggested. So we did some qualitative legwork in the first paper, some comparative statics, uh, just to show what's important for tipping, but you know, not that that's not the end in and of itself. Without any data, when we did the first paper, the best we could do was characterize the problem. Now that we have data, we can estimate different things and put some empirics on it, and do a cost benefit analysis. And, different policy levels that we have on uh, Real quickly, some of the comparative statics we looked at is the marginal transmission rate of pollination. We call that beta in the model. So we conjecture that beta is between zero and one. Lower values of beta mean the first neighbor is the most contiguous. So each subsequent neighbor has a smaller or at most equal effect, so it's diminishing marginal pollination likelihood. Um, field trial data could really help us here to get an estimate, like a hard estimate of um, of beta, or at the very least, the distribution of beta that we could um, use to more thoroughly characterize our our uh, uh, network structure. That's what I was trying to say. We can characterize the network structure. So looking at this graph, the first place where um, one of these curves intersects the 45 degree line is the proportion of the initial fiber adopters or non floral users that causes the tip, right? And it sends that cascading effect in motion. The second intersection is with going off to the right is the resulting steady state. So the fiber adopters in T plus one. So the second time we do these outputs from our first paper, we're more just qualitatively identifying and characterizing the problem. Basically, how does everything work and what factors matter the most. Uh, now with some recent data, we can actually estimate that structure. We can quantify the tipping points and we can characterize the certain states. And we can evaluate the cost effectiveness of different policy instruments that we own to uh, prevent that tip from happening. And then for a fixed value of beta and a fixed number of neighbors, basically all you need to take away from this graph is as you increase the relative attractiveness of fiber, so the profitability of fiber relative to the profitability of floral, you know, then the tip will occur earlier, leading to greater steady states. Okay, so we can see that the tip is very sensitive to the size of beta, that marginal transmission rate for pollination, 
And so it would be more effective in avoiding the tip by mitigating transmission than monkeying with the payoff distributions to be the problem. Okay. So we can manipulate that marginal rate of pollen and of non political hemp using policy. So that's what we did in the first paper. What we're working on now is okay, there's still a gap in the literature. Okay. We can address that gap by, you know, kind of working on, let's put some hard impurities on this. Let's take some data. Let's actually estimate this network structure, quantify what kind of policy levers we can pull to avoid this, this tip happening. Ideally, we could take GPS location and data from individual fields, but that's protected. And so the next best thing we can do is have location masked field data and we can look at acres, we can look at fields, we can look at operations within a county, right, and make that contribution. So what we're working with now is data from uh, Kentucky hemp growers from 2017, 2018, 2019, collected by the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. We have location masked field specific variables like what county it's in, operating costs, capital investment, yield, what cultivar is planted, acreage, all that sort of thing. Uh, using field trial data, we can get a better idea of what data the marginal rate of transmission looks like. We're working on collecting that now. Different people have uh, at least initiated or are coming away. Please wrap it up, Jeffrey. Okay, we'll do. Two obvious cases we can look at are randomly located fields and spatially clustered or autocorrelated fields. And so that's uh, one way we can look at the network structure is okay, we've got beta, we've got these two scenarios that we can put in there. And then I'll leave it with this. Possibly po uh, possible policy levers we can suggest pulling and evaluate their cost effectiveness would just be leave this dispute to the courts and let policy or pollination complaints settle themselves, uh, propose adjustments to crop insurance rules, mandate wind blocks like they do for GMO corn, require minimum field to field distances between floral and non floral hemp, or require staggered planting dates for floral and non floral hemp. And so, the next step would be do some cost of cost benefits analysis for that. Sorry if I ran. <laughs> Thank you, Jeffrey. I'm I'm going before we move on. It appears that whoever is calling in over the phone is causing the problem with our background noise, and so I'm not sure how to fix that because I'm maybe the phone is bringing in all the background noise. Um, but my understanding is everybody else is muted. So if you're on the phone, please somehow cover it up so that we don't hear that background noise. Thank you, um, Jeffrey. Moving on, we're going to go from an agronomy game playing uh, paper to an overview of the United States hemp pilot programs from 2014 to 2019 and what's ahead. And the authors on this are Tyler Mark, Will Snell, and Jonathan Shepard. And I believe Tyler is the presenter. Jane, hey, thank you very much uh, for allowing us to present here today. And, you know, I was. When I, we, we initially put this together, I was thinking that this was going to be something that's old, but something that, that uh, is old is now new again. Uh, the 2014 pilot program was supposed to sunset at uh, October of uh, October 31st of this year, and now it's been extended to September uh, 2021. So this program continues to live on, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of what we've seen in Ed, and then I'll get to what, uh, what I think we, we're going to see coming up in 2020 and beyond. So let's see. Um, so this is the actual report, and I should make mention of the the co-authors of this report: uh, Jonathan Shepard, David Olson, Will Snell, uh, Susan Proper, and, and Suzanne Thornsberry. Uh, this was a piece that was published uh, earlier this year, and, and talks about all the different uh, pieces of the 2014 Farm Bill uh, that came about. Um, and all the what all the different pilot programs are doing 
uh, in these states. Uh, it was kind of an exciting report to put together and, and something that was pushed through pretty quickly. So uh, thanks to all them for, for their efforts and, and it's out there and you can find this report. So what, what you're gonna see is that um, since the, the introduction of hemp back into the, to the United States in 2014, we've seen a rapid ramp up of acreages across, uh, across the country and that happened all the way into 2018 and, it, and it's still going up. Uh, even today, we've got more acres than we had uh, previously. However, prices have come down quite a bit and, and I'll show you that here in a second. But uh, what you will notice on this is that the, you'll see FSA acres, both hemp acres and acres reported by states, and you'll see a big discrepancy among those. And this is one of the big uh, key points of this report was that acres have increased rapidly, but there's a lack of consistency in the reported data out there. And this is going to continue to plague this industry uh, for the next year or so until we get into the 2018 Farm Bill and everybody has to adhere to that and FSA uh, gets all the reported hemp acres uh, out there. So FSA is closing in that gap on that gap, but not at this point in time, everybody still doesn't have to uh, report to FSA. Uh, that's been kind of an interesting thing, especially with new growers, uh, because new growers never reported to FSA or they didn't know how to set up um, the reporting to FSA or they've never had to report to FSA. So that's been kind of an interesting piece to this industry is we've had a large number of new producers enter the market um, they never really knew or had to deal with FSA and reporting acreages. Uh, this is just a graphic that kind of shows the, the proliferation or the expansion of hemp uh, across, across the country. And uh, keep in mind that this is not a, uh, a complete uh, picture because this is based on the FSA data. So there is uh, some data points and, and acreages missing, but you can see some of the key states like Colorado, Kentucky, um, Montana, Oregon, a few of those early entries into the, the hemp market and how it's expanded rapidly um, across the U.S. So where are we going with all this? Uh, and I think this is really more the interesting piece to this is this is an industry that uh, when I first got into this, uh, you talked about uh, a lot of production that was going to take place and it was all going to be um, it was all going to be uh, uh, the golden ticket or the golden crop and, and everybody was going to get rich off of it. And we saw lots of production come into to play and now prices have started to, uh, to come down significantly. So if you look at the 2020 picture, uh, this is kind of what you see. Uh, you see states like Colorado, Kentucky have kind of stepped back a little bit. I mean, even in the state of Kentucky uh, for 2019, we had 60,000 licensed acres, about uh, 20,000, 22,000 harvested acres. And for 2020, uh, we're going to have about uh, 4,000 harvested acres uh, for, or 5,000 harvested acres. So we've seen uh, in states like that, we've, we've taken big steps back in those number of acres. Uh, as we've seen some of these contracts fall through and, and some of the other uh, dynamics of the market take place. But on June 18 of 2020, we had 465,000 acres um, out there um, that were reported, a 9% increase in 2019, and still a, a significant number of increase in the number of growers um, as more and more areas within the country continue to uh, look into this crop. And just to kind of give you a ballpark idea, um, as we stand today with, with AMS approval of, of hemp plans uh, across the country, there's about 38 approved tribal plans, 28 uh, state plans that have been approved, three territories that have been approved. Uh, and you got several states that are also um, operating under the 2014 uh, pilot program uh, that are still left out there. And then you've got uh, a number of other states who are going to be in USDA uh, hemp program. So the, there is still a lot of uh, excitement about this crop. It's just waned a little bit, and, and I think it's going to shift, um, have some shift in where the focus of some of this crop uh, actually goes into the, into, uh, the coming years. Um, I spoke a little bit about this, but uh, prior to uh, early January, uh, we came off of uh, the 2018 crop. There was a lot of excitement. Came into January of 2019, prices were up around that uh, 350 to to five, almost five dollars a point 
uh, depending upon where you were at in the country on, on a percent CBD basis. And then along around uh, July, that price really started to slide as we started to see how many acres were actually coming into production. And I think that's one of the things that we don't really have a good handle on yet is how big is the market for this? And maybe Trey will fill us in. He's going to give us all the magic answers in this next presentation, um, you know, on how big the actual CBD market is and or maybe essential oils would be a better word for that. And how um, all the, the acres that were coming into this and we don't know how many acres the U.S. actually needs to produce to get to that point uh, of market saturation. I think we're way over that. Um, just some back of the back of the envelope numbers we may only need uh, you know 20,000, 30,000 acres to, to fill that market. So I think that's uh, uh, something that to, to think about as we go forward uh, is how many acres are actually needed. Um, but prices are down quite a bit. Uh, I tell of all of our producers in Kentucky, you need to think about how to produce this crop for under a dollar a point. Um, kind of look at this and break this up by region. Um, you can start to see some regions are outperforming other regions. Uh, Kentucky's kind of a low one um, in pricing. Uh, the Northeast tends to have some stronger prices. Uh, and I think that's a function of smaller farms, maybe some niche farms that are looking into more of the uh, CBD and the smokable hemp side of the market. So there's some, some opportunities there. Uh, we're also seeing on the, the product pricing side, uh, those prices continue to fall uh, and they're getting, uh, are continuing to fall into to this year. We did have a slight uptick in some of these um, as we had some new crop come into production, but, uh, or as we started having new product or new uh, floral material hit the market, but uh, they're continuing to go down as we continue to refine and get better uh, better processing in place uh, for these prices or for these products. So where are we going? Um, I really think we're starting to see a resetting of the market and the expectations uh, within this. So uh, processors, banks, uh, everybody around the industry is starting to figure out what, uh, how many acres are actually needed. Uh, I think THC limit is another one that's uh, kind of a regulatory hurdle. Um, it's set by Congress at 0.03%, um, but there's been a lot of push to push that to one. But keep in mind that also has an impact on the number of acres needed. If you push it to one, CBD runs about 25 to one in terms of THC limit. So at a 0.3%, you get about 7.5% CBD uh, on that plan. If you push it to one, now you're looking at 25% CBD and you're gonna look at decreasing the number of acres and, and really shrinking the area that uh, will need production. Uh, I think we'll see a lot of genetic improvements continuing, but we need regs around that. So is it 0.3% gonna be the reg? Because the breeders uh, need to know what that is. Uh, and also going back to even Jeffrey's point that he made with, uh, with pollen, uh, how do we get, uh, can we minimize pollen drift out of these or do we even uh, deal with uh, feminized seed going forward and one other policy thing that you may consider is that there is no need for policy because uh, we go to we don't worry about feminized seed and we go to a much larger mechanical model uh, where you, your CBD percentage comes way down but you harvest it on much larger acres so that could be another piece in there too is that you may not even need to consider policy. Uh, increases in licensed acres and growers is still there uh, the 2014 Farm Bill has, has been extended, so we're going to we're going to have some of these battles coming up in 2021, where a producer uh, planted in a state under the 2014 Farm Bill, if they don't get it harvested before the end of September, do they fall under the the 14 Farm Bill, or or are they now under the 2018 Farm Bill, which has significant changes in it uh, that that can be problematic? Uh, so there's still lots of unclear regs on FDA, DEA, CBD, and food. How many acres are actually needed? Uh, there's minimal contracts right now available. So you saw a lot of producers, especially in the state of Kentucky and uh, some other larger states, uh, they had contracts in that 2019 timeframe. Prices fell. Uh, many of the companies didn't have the cash on hand to, to deal with those contracts, so they broke those contracts. Um, one of the other things with minimal contract availability is that you actually need a contract to actually get crop insurance. So um, maybe we'll start to see as the market now is hopefully settled out uh, at the bottom or near the bottom, 
uh, some of those contracts coming back and then you can get into crop insurance and provide some other protections. I think we're still gonna continue to see bankruptcies, reorgs and consolidation within the industry as we continue to move forward. All right, I'm gonna stop there um, and try and answer any questions uh, that you may have. You have one minute for questions or less because we got to get back on time. Anybody have any questions? Oh, put them in. I think you have to put them in the chat box. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll check the chat box. So you can, as uh, while we move on, you can write your question in the chat box. We are moving to the consumer side of the marketplace. And our third presentation is titled, Who is Buying CBD? And this presentation is by Trey Malone and Brandon McFadden. And I believe Trey is the presenter. So you have about 12 to 14 minutes, Max. All right. Well, so Tyler said I was gonna give you the magic answers. Uh, unfortunately, there's no way that's true. Uh, so instead I'm gonna drink some Michigan cider while we talk because that is one of the magic answers. Um, so what I'm gonna be talking about today is, uh, is who's buying CBD, but I, I thought I would kind of take a step further back um, and Tyler's heard me talk about this a little bit already, but, but trying to talk through assessing what um, the, the future of any market might be. Uh, you know, CBD in 2016 was uh, like a nothing burger. I don't think anybody really even talked about it in 2016. Um, and then all of a sudden it became all anybody was talking about, right? Like uh, when I was, um, so family video, I don't know if anybody knows family video. Well, family video sells an insane amount of CBD in the state of Michigan now. Okay. So all of a sudden we went from like nobody talking about it to even family video having a full CBD section. All right. So, so of course there were a lot of growers who saw that movement and thought maybe this is something that we need to be thinking about as an industry. So the first thing that I really want to highlight in terms of steps to determine whether or not you should really be moving in that direction is first to assess whether that consumer willingness to pay or willingness to substitute or complement is a long-term positive for your industry. Okay, so here's an article that came out uh, last year that I thought was really well done uh, in Consumer Reports. Brandon and I are, uh, are working on kind of our own version of something like this with a co-author. Uh, where what we're looking at is, is um, who exactly is using CBD and what are they using it for as a substitution for other products. Uh, so, you know, millennials and baby boomers are, are the, the groups that people like to talk about probably the most in terms of age demographics. And what you'll notice is the way that those two groups utilize CBD very dramatically. All right. So if you are thinking you're going to get into this marketplace, there is a lot of value in understanding what that marketplace might actually uh, be able to support. Uh, and it's it's not clear that, that that marketplace is able to support you know a ton of these uh, these growers, um, particularly if you're only doing the growth side and you're not thinking about your market structure in a vertically integrated fashion. Uh, now, younger people tend to use CBD more than older people, at least as of right now, um, or at least as of 2019. Now we'll see in the, in the data in a little bit that we've seen a lot of you know strange shifts. I would say. Uh, but, but a lot of people are also using it to, uh, to again, reduce stress and anxiety, uh, which lines up with my, my point about millennials using it more often. Okay, so this is a figure from a, a paper that Brandon and I are hopefully going to have published uh, soon. We've, we've been through multiple rounds of, of reviews now. But, uh, but what we were really interested in here is thinking about these, um, these items uh, of what people are using CBD for and what those items specifically relate to other products that might be uh, in the same marketplace. Now, the reason why this matters is because a lot of the, the arguments for why people use CBD go back to some type of medical use, all right? And so as we started grouping uh, the medical use or the perceived value of medical use of different products, if you'll notice, uh, alcohol here is, uh, is one of the, the least valuable uh, items for medical use. You know, of course, the irony being that during Prohibition, that was uh, what helped at least float some alcohol producers over the same period of time. Uh, but, you know, THC, hemp, uh, you know, marijuana, CBD, all of these things are perceived to have much higher medical use than some of the uh, standard products. 
Uh, now, as we group these things, uh, THC and hemp go together, actually, while uh, CBD and marijuana are actually grouped better than the other two in terms of perceived medical use. Uh, so, so there are probably some really interesting ideas that you could tease out here about how to uh, posture your, your uh, marijuana or your uh, CBD hemp business. Okay, so another thing that, that really matters here is, is not only the perceptions of medical use, but also the perceptions of, uh, of you know, potential substance abuse issues. Now, this is something that uh, I think we all uh, at some level have to, to really grapple with while we move this industry forward is, uh, is not only what the research says about the potential for abuse, but also what the homegrown perceptions of the potential for abuse actually are. Now, um, of course, the things that are going to be grouped together in our data that are the, the highest perceptions for abuse are heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, oxycodone. Uh, but, but as we move down this level, uh, you can see that, that at least there is some bit of concern regarding uh, marijuana having this potential for abuse that ranks higher than if you just talk about specific THC or CBD. Uh, again, there could be some consumer confusion here. But you could also imagine that, uh, that when people start thinking about scientific terms like THC and CBD, they might actually think about something different. Now, if we plot these things together, I think we, we can tell a really interesting story by quadrant. So there are certain items that group together really nicely because consumers see there as some value for medical use and a pretty low potential for abuse. Now, in this figure, the, uh, the, the origin of the figure is kind of this 50-50, this, uh, probably not, you know, but um, Advil, Tylenol, CBD, and hemp all fit together in this quadrant that consumers believe or perceive as having a low potential for abuse, but some possible high medical use. Uh, and so that's kind of exciting if you want to think about developing CBD as some type of a medical product. Um, we also tried to out estimate the reasons for consumption of CBD and or THC as a replacement for other substances. Um, and what we found there was, was that, you know, there is this kind of interesting um, variation in how consumers replace a prescription or over-the-counter medication uh, for the, uh, the overall product. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not convinced uh, that there is that much of a substitution effect going on. Uh, I, it, it looks to me that in this data, at least, the substitution is often at least a conversation between some complementary product. Okay, so one thing that I do want to point out is we collected this data, um, uh, well, at the, well, it feels like a million years ago, but it was actually at the end of 2019. Again, I just showed you some data that prior that uh, from Consumer Reports, same time. Notice the ramp up from 2018 to 2020. Uh, the beginning of 2020 in Google Trends data. Now, if you'll see, like CBD really took off. Uh, but the weirdest part of this whole figure to me is what happened when the pandemic began. I don't know about you guys, but like I have been wildly stressed, absurdly anxious. I am like, like I, my life is like completely different than what it was this time last year. So you would think that that people like me would be looking for some type of alternative that would prevent uh, this anxiety or would help with my anxiety and my um, my issue with the world. And yet we don't see that happening in the data for CBD. We haven't seen like a, a big uptick in uh, in demand for CBD from March on. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I don't know exactly what's going on there, but it doesn't seem to be really translating. Okay, so the next thing that you need to think about, and, and again, part of the reason that I, I want to think about this in a step process is we, we had hemp. Before that, we had hops here in Michigan that everybody jumped into. I don't know what the next thing is going to be. I've got a grant on morels, so maybe we're going to grow morel mushrooms next. Maybe we're going to do aquaculture. i got a grant on aquaculture that people are really into right now. Uh, but, but each of these different items need to be considered within the comparative advantage of your community, uh, of, of in your extension group or whatever. Uh, so, you know, at least in the uh, United States, and, and I'm not going to speak too much to the production side of it, but, but I did publish a paper a couple years ago. Now, um, at the time, you know, I had somebody from the Mercatus Center reach out to me and say, what do we know about hemp? And frankly, 
I didn't know anything about hemp at the time. I didn't even like if you if you told me a while back that I was going to be talking about hemp, I would have never believed you. And yet, um, you know, I end up giving this or writing this paper about you know what what's going on in hemp production. And one thing that's really starting to become more and more clear is that each of these places have a different comparative and competitive competitive advantage for for growing and processing hemp. And part of it is related to the market size of the of the communities that are are already producing. Uh, so obviously, Kentucky is going to be a big player here. Colorado is going to be a big player for a different reason, I think. And we're seeing that really play out in the data since this 2017 data was was posted. Um, you know, Tyler's already done a great job on that. Okay, so another thing that I really want to highlight for anybody that's really thinking about getting into the CBD market is understanding the institutional framework that might help or hinder, hinder that new market. We've definitely seen that in hemp. Um, you know, as CBD is moving forward, there's all these questions about what the FDA is doing. Um, in terms of, of managing and mitigating some of the, the CB potential risks or perceived risks, particularly with limited research. Um, you know, fortunately, we've seen, I think, a, a big, really incredible movement towards doing more research. Uh, I believe Jane is, is uh, the PI on a pretty cool grant right now to do more of this stuff. Uh, but, but what we really need to be thinking about in the longer term is... Uh, how that, uh, how that FDA process is going to affect the marketplace, uh, not just for CBD, but for whatever the, the next new thing might be. I also just want to point this out because I think it's really interesting. Uh, Michigan just last year, wow, two years ago, uh, passed this uh, ballot proposal number one on recreational marijuana. It carried really well, actually. And so I've, I've kind of just wondered or speculated that, that hemp is this gateway crop for some of the producers that I talk to, where what they're really curious about is what the, the future of, of cannabis more broadly is than just hemp. Uh, and I, I think that we're maybe even seeing something of a blurring of the lines as we talk about like THC constraints in hemp markets uh, as maybe being this, uh, this next, next step. That, uh, that allows you to extract CBD, not just from hemp, but potentially from you know, um, stronger strains of cannabis. Uh, I also think that this indoor-outdoor production conversation is really interesting. Uh, you know, if you talk to people, they say growing uh, hemp for CBD is more like a tomato plant. And, and so that, that question mark there, I think, has led a lot of the floor culture folks here in the state of Michigan to start moving towards at least evaluating hemp as a product that they might grow. I actually visited a, uh, um, a, a f well, former at this point, um, oh shoot, what's the red flower that everybody grows and the, all the grandmas buy for uh, poinsettias. So, uh, so there's a poinsettia market that, uh, that's really, you know, was a big deal in the state of Michigan, but as people are buying less and less poinsettias, a lot of those floriculture producers are starting to pivot towards something new and hemp tended to be the thing that they moved toward. But frankly, if I looked at that production system, it sure does look like they might be setting up pretty nicely for uh, for uh, a larger cannabis operation. Thirty uh, seconds. Play. I also mentioned the post. Okay, I also mentioned the post office problem, just being that like to get the testing done, uh, we've seen some issues with uh, with different uh, postal workers not being willing to process the stuff because of you know some unclear leg uh, regulation on on what can and can't be shipped as it relates to that. So so as we kind of. Um, more explicitly define what the marketplace is. Uh, I think we'll also see more explicitly defined rules, which will again lead to consolidation of the marketplace. Uh, you know, people are still confused about the two difference, the difference between the two in hemp and can or hemp and marijuana. But overall, you know, I, I think hemp and CBD is providing us a lot of opportunities to learn, not just for this market, but for markets moving forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and please write your any questions you might have in the chat box. Moving right along, our last presentation, consumer demand for hemp products beyond CBD. So these are very complementary. Um, this is a paper by myself and my graduate student, Hannah Lacasse. And I'm going to give Hannah the opportunity to do the presentation. Um, we, we will say though that our, our first paper is out in sustainability and it is open access. So Hannah, take it away. Thank you, Jane. Um, hopefully this is working. Mm. You should be able to share your screen.
Sorry, everybody. Are you able to hear me now? Is this working, Jane? I'm not hearing anyone. We can hear you. We just can't oh. see the screen. You can't see the screen? No. Oh, geez. How about now? Yes. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. Sorry about that, everybody. I just kicked myself out of the meeting. Um, thank you, Jane. Um, as Jane said, my name is Hannah Lacasse. I'm an MS student in UVM's Community Development and Applied Economics program. Um, and today I'll be talking about our findings on consumer behavior toward temp-based products. Um, and these results really serve as a foundation to understand consumer demand for hemp-based products and demonstrate where there's opportunity in this new and emerging marketplace. And so we know hemp is a sustainable alternative. Um, it's a sustainable crop. It can make sustainable products and a variety of products at that. Um, and hemp production brings potential for farmers. Uh, but we're really here today to discuss the end products of hemp and the consumer demand associated with those products. Uh, there are thousands of products ranging from plastics and milk substitutes to rope and soap, and we're specifically looking at demand for these types of products by consumers in Vermont. And so let's first start by comparing hemp production in Vermont with the U.S. Uh, we've seen rising interest in production across the country since the passing of the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, we see an increase from 2016 to 2019 in the eight acres registered for hemp production, both in the state of Vermont and in the U.S. Um, and we see similar trends between Vermont and the U.S. for hemp registrations as well, um, though because of the many smaller growers in Vermont, that percentage increase is a bit larger compared to the nation. Vermont is also comparable to the U.S. in the challenges we face in regards to hemp production, including but not limited to pricing and market saturation. A statistic provided by the Vermont Agency of Ag states that 50% of surveyed growers did not have a buyer by the end of the 2019 growing season. And we can also see that registrations and registered acres in the previous graph dropped quite a bit in Vermont from 2019 to 2020. And lastly, um, as Trey mentioned in the previous presentation, CBD production has dominated this industry thus far, and Vermont is no exception. Um, the Vermont Agency of Ag again estimates that 75% of hemp growers in 2019 were growing for floral biomass, which we can assume is for CBD production. And so all this to say is that Vermont can serve as a comparable lens to understand consumer demand um, for hemp in the U.S. more broadly. Um, the image to the right shows hemp production by county in Vermont for the 2019 season. Uh, and we can continue to grow hemp, but unless we know that there's a demand for its products, there's really no point. Um, an absence of peer-reviewed research and data on the U.S. hemp consumer market has been identified as an active hurdle to addressing the challenges, such as those that I presented in the previous slide, um, to the hemp industry. And so today I'll be discussing what we do know about the hemp consumer market through the case of Vermont. And in doing so, hope to begin to address, it, um, address this gap in knowledge and start to understand consumer demand more broadly. And so first I'll provide an overview um, of a manuscript Jane and I submitted this fall that compares 2019 and 2020 data to understand trends of hemp consumption in Vermont over time. And then lastly, I'll um, provide a simple descriptive summary of some data on Vermonter attitudes towards hemp, which will provide some direction as to where we're going next in our research. And so the data used um, for this study is from a statistically representative telephone survey of Vermont residents in February of 2019 and 2020. This is based on a random sample of landline and cell phone numbers. And we look at three base questions across both years, familiarity with hemp products, support for hemp as an agricultural product in the state, and use of hemp products. And we ask about specific hemp product categories, such as CBD, clothing, personal care, food products, etc. We also use several demographic characteristics in this study, uh, age, education, gender, income, location, uh, which is our urban versus rural equivalent, 
and political affiliation. And as I said before, we were also able to ask a few more questions in 2020 regarding attitudes, and we'll discuss that at the end of the presentation. So this study looks at Vermonter demand for hemp products over time. This table shows what our sample looked like. Again, we have the demographics that I mentioned in the previous slide. And with this study, we wanted to see if there were differences in the way demographic characteristics impacted our dependent variables from 2019 to 2020. Uh, so that means that 2019 and 2020 were not just intercept shifters. Both year and demographic characteristics made a difference in predicting whether respondents were supportive of hemp, familiar with hemp, or users of hemp. We created interaction terms with a dummy variable for year in each of the seven demographic characteristics. We then ran likelihood ratio tests to determine whether structural change was influenced by responding characteristics or that the interaction terms were different from zero. And um, a preview is that we end up failing to reject the null for all of our dependent variables, support familiarity and use. Um, so we, what we really end up doing is using the year as an intercept shifter um, and there is no interaction effect or changes in the slope shifters of the demographics and we're just looking at the logistic regressions. And so to start, we have support uh, for hemp production in Vermont. Three quarters of Vermonters are support supportive, very small change from 2019 to 2020 and our bivariates say that that is not statistically uh, different. And we failed to reject the null that the interaction terms were different from zero and run logistic regressions to understand the influence of demographics on support. Um, and for these tables that I'm going to show, I'm only showing the significant results um, and I'm showing the exponential betas and the associated significances. And so for support, we see that age is negatively associated with support, though it's very close to one. Um, income is positively associated with support and political affiliation is also positively associated with support. So Democrats are 2.6 times more likely, independents 2.8 times more likely, and progressives 6.3 times more likely to support hemp compared to Republican respondents. We then have general familiarity with hemp-based products, meaning that respondents were familiar with at least one hemp product category. And familiarity grew by about 10 percentage points from 2019 to 2020. And our bivariate results find that this is statistically significant. Again, we failed to reject the null hypothesis that the interaction terms were different from zero. And so we run logistic regressions. And we find that respondents were 3.6 times more likely to be familiar with hemp products in 2020 compared to 2019. Again, older respondents are more likely to be familiar with hemp products, but very close to being one, um, meaning they would just as likely to be familiar or they're very close to that. And then those in the highest income category were 3.3 times more likely to be familiar compared to the lowest. And then we have um, use, general use of hemp-based products. So um, respondents used at least one of the product categories we provide, provided. And use jumps um, quite substantially from 2019 to 2020, um, and that relationship is significant. And once again, uh, we cannot reject the null that all interaction effects were different from zero. So we run logistic regressions with year as an intercept shifter. And we find that respondents are 2.3 times more likely to use hemp products in 2020 compared to 2019. Hemp seems to be seeping into the marketplace. People are purchasing it more. And once again, we find that political affiliation comes into play. Independent and progressive respondents are 1.9 and 2.6 times more likely to use hemp products compared to Republican respondents. We see similar trends when we apply these methods to use of specific hemp product categories. Uh, a greater percentage of respondents used both hemp CBD and hemp clothing in 2020 compared to 2019, and those relationships are significant. Again, we reject the nulls for both hypotheses that the interaction effects were different from zero. And so we run logistic regressions for both categories of product. And for both CBD and clothing, respondents were 2.9 and 3.1 times more likely to use um, in 2020 compared to 2019. 
And aside from age for hemp clothing, um, which is significant, but again, quite close to zero, or to one rather, uh, the only significant demographic predictors are political affiliation. Independent respondents are 1.7 times more likely to use hemp CBD, and independent and progressive respondents are 2.5 and 3.4 times more likely to use hemp clothing. And if we think about political affiliation as based on ideology and beliefs and attitudes, and considering that very few other demographic characteristics predict hemp use, this may indicate that use of hemp products is based on attitudes um, towards hemp. And there may be room for the hemp market to continue to grow as we continue to distinguish hemp from marijuana. And now because of the differences in survey recall, we weren't able to conduct these analyses for all of the specific hemp product categories that were discussed in the survey. Um, for example, personal care products and food. But we can take a look at the trends because it's interesting. Um, for every product category, there's a higher percentage of respondent use in 2020 compared to 2019. Um, so that includes CBD, clothing, personal care products, rope, food products, and paper. And here we see another representation of the 2020 data based on total instances of hemp product use by category. And we were curious how our data compared to the rest of the country. So now we also see industry estimates for hemp product sales in 2019. And the two are pretty comparable, particularly for CBD, clothing, food products, and personal care products. And so um, this these data tell us a couple of things. One is that Vermont mirrors the rest of the country when it comes to demand and serves as a bellwether for the hemp market in the US. And it's an indication that this research is relevant to the rest of the nation more broadly. Second is that despite a focus on CBD production, we find that Vermonters are using a variety of hemp-based products, indicating that demand is much more inclusive and points to opportunities for growers and processors to diversify. But as I've shown in previous slides, we're still trying to understand the hemp consumer. It doesn't appear that demographic characteristics are consistent nor strong predictors of use, but a political affiliation is. And that tells us that attitudes and beliefs may play a more substantial role. And that's kind of where our research is heading next. And so this slide is based on 2020 data sourced from the same survey as the study before. And though we haven't really dived into these survey questions yet um, and their relationships to other variables, I still wanted to share them with you because I think it's interesting and it gives us a glimpse of where our research will look forward. Um, so we can see that the majority of respondents would purchase hemp products if it supported the local economy. The majority would buy hemp products if they were available. Uh, about half agree that the regulatory environment is hindering hemp's economic opportunity. A little over half agree that hemp should be deregulated. The majority agree that hemp production can help farmers diversify. Agree that hemp fiber products are strong and durable and that products are envir environmentally friendly. And then the majority don't know whether other crops require more inputs compared to hemp. And then lastly, the majority uh, disagree that hemp and marijuana contain the same amount of THC. And so to summarize um, the data that I just presented, we know that there's been structural change over time as hemp-based products come into the market, more people are familiar and are using them, um, but this change doesn't appear to be driven by demographics. Um, our findings indicate that year and political affiliation really stand for all of the variables that we weren't able to include in our study, um, such as the attitude statements in the previous slide. We know that Vermonters are using a variety of hemp-based goods despite a focus on CBD and consumer research on hemp should be inclusive of those products. And so in the next year, we'll be adding to our list of questions asked in the survey of Vermonters and include um, more attitude statements, intention to purchase, and try to capture regular versus one-time use of hemp. And we hope to apply these questions to specific hemp product categories to flesh out the hemp consumer a bit more. We're working with the Colorado State and the University of Kentucky on a USDA grant that includes a national consumer survey. Um, and so our data on Vermont will help inform that national survey. So a lot more work to do. We've really just hit the tip of the iceberg and we look forward to making more progress in the coming months. 
Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, panelists. Thank you for attending this session. We are just at three o'clock, which means we made our one hour time period. Thank you, um, Crenet and the AEM section for being the host of this track session. And um, enjoy, enjoy your afternoon and look forward to, you can look forward to seeing this session and seeing the slides on the AAEA website once the webinar is uploaded. So thanks everyone and have a great day.